God bless you and thank you once again for tuning in. Thank you for your prayers and support um, um, of this ministry. I will thank God that God is really blessing us and this ministry is touching lives. If you join us for the first time, welcome to our Heroes Hall of Fame series, part 36. Uh, this is a study from the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We're looking at um, the, the men and women of faith mentioned in this book. We've talked about um, Abel, Enoch, Noah. Now we're looking at the life of Abraham. Last week we talked about why it's hard to wait upon God. So if you miss any of these lessons, you know, you can always watch it online at our YouTube channel, which is YouTube at Noah's Ark Sanctuary Church. Or you can join us on Facebook. So today we're going to be talking about why we have to wait upon God and the consequences of impatience. I'm still on the case study of Abraham and Sarah. We're learning the pitfalls of, uh, of their journey of faith. So why do we have to wait upon God? Um, one, because God has a greater purpose. We, we, we see in Genesis 16, 1 to 2, that Sarah, Abraham's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Agar. So Sarah said to Abraham, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children to her. And Abraham agreed with Sarah's proposal. Now they've been waiting for so long. And they have to take charge of the situation which was in the flesh, which was according to human reasoning, not waiting upon God. But God has, has a bigger purpose. So number one reason we have to wait upon God is because God has a stronger or a greater purpose to be fulfilled through us, which is more than just our own personal request. You know, Abraham had, Abraham and Sarah just were more concerned about having a child they could call their own, but God has a greater purpose, which will not only affect their own lives, but the many lives around them and even impact nations. Okay? Because God's purpose was for them to have a child, which, you know, will be the builder of the Jewish nation and also to which the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will come. And we read this in Genesis chapter 18, 17 to 19. And this is what God said to Abraham when he was on his way to examine uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and to pass his judgment. So he said, should I hide my plan from Abraham? The Lord asked, for Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation. So that was the purpose. So Abraham was, not, was only thinking about maybe just having their child of their own, but God says, you know, Abraham, you're going to be a great and mighty nation through this seed I'm going to give you. And the whole earth, the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. And that's the seed of him, which is the Messiah, which is to come. And again, he said, I've singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I'll do for Abraham all that I have promised. Let's look at another example, you know, um, on, the, on this same line uh, from the Old Testament, the example of Anna, um, the mother of the prophet Samuel. Uh, remember, she too had problem in childbearing. First Samuel chapter 1, 6 to 7, written from the New Living Translation, says, So Penina will taunt Anna, I make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same Penina who taunt Anna as they went to the tabernacle. Now, Penina is the second wife of Ekana, the, um, um, uh, the wife of Alkana, the second wife. So each time, Anna will be reduced to tears and will not even eat because the other wife was making fun and teasing her. That I should just go away, you know, I'm the right um, wife, I'm the correct wife, I'm the one that is blessed. So Anna too wanted the child to be called her own, but God had a greater purpose, so she had to wait. So it, because God through her wanted her, okay, to raise up a child. 
a child that would teach his people the right way, that would teach his people the ways of God and also be a leader and a judge in Israel to deliver his people from their enemies. And let's cross over to the New Testament. Another biblical example of why you know, um, we have to wait upon God because God has a greater purpose than just our own personal requests or personal needs. And this is an example of Mary and Martha who loved Jesus, who were friends of Jesus, uh, who wanted their brother Lazarus to be healed. Now, Jesus was told Lazarus was sick, but he didn't just rush down there. Um, why? Because he had to wait for God's timing. And that's why it's very dangerous when we do um, healing meetings, you know, and promise people to come and be healed because everybody has, has their timing. God has a time for everyone. And that's why some people go disappointed. And sometimes ministers might blame them because they lack faith or, you know, tell them something, you know, um, where it's going to come. But everything is on timing. You know, we can't manipulate or control the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus said in John 5 19. He says, so Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees his father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. So the son cannot just do what he wants. That's what Jesus is saying. He has to wait for the father's word before he moves. So he waited until Lazarus died in, in order to manifest his power and his glory to those who were ordained and to eternal life. Um, who were ordained to, 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 to get to know the Messiah, to believe in Messiah, that they might believe on his name. We read it in John eleven three. we said the two sisters sent a message <clears throat> called, telling him, Lord, your dear friend is sick. And then in John eleven six, 6, we, we read New King James Version, said, John eleven six. 6, so when he had, he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Why? Because God has a greater purpose. And, and, and reason is, John eleven forty to 46, Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you will see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. So the purpose, you know, it's a greater purpose. And God's greater purpose was that they might know that Jesus, the anointed one, Christ, the Messiah, Okay, so and in verse 45 of John 11, we read many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. So that was the reason, that was God's greater purpose. So, the first lesson if you are waiting upon God, you've been waiting for a long time, you know, um, God has a greater purpose. He wants to, God has a greater purpose, He wants to fulfill in your life. Okay. Um, as they say, there is no testimony without a test. And I pray that you will pass this test of waiting on Jesus' mighty name. Okay? I pray that you pass this test of waiting in Jesus' mighty name. So, why do I have to wait upon, wait upon God? Because God has a greater purpose than our own personal needs and requests that will impact lives around us and even impact nations. Number two, God tests our faith to strengthen us. Okay? God wants to see if we are truly going to wait for him to take or take the satanic express train to temporary fulfillment. So God is going to test our faith, you know, to strengthen us. He wants to see whether we're going to wait for him or take the satanic express bus or train of plain, you know, uh, to temporary fulfillment. You know, this is what the Bible says in Hebrews 11.25, I read it from the King James Version, it says about Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction. So waiting is like affliction, you're waiting for something, you know, uh, uh, with the people of God. Because he said with the people of God, that is, the other people that are waiting, we all have things that we have to wait for. Than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, the pleasure of sin, when we don't want to wait, wait upon God, you know, then we take Satan, Satan's express train or boss of fear. We give you temporary fulfillment, 
but it's just for a season and to end in disaster. Let's look at another example in the Old Testament um, in Exodus 32 1 to 4. Uh, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back to the mountains, he got led them to this mountain of God. And, um, and God called the son Moses, and the people, people were tired of waiting. And they said, Okay, to Aaron, Moses' um, brother, um, older brother, and sister, and come on, they said, Let's Make us some gods who can lead us. That's what we do when we don't wait upon God. We, we, we make ourselves other ways. And the other way is the way of the devil. There's no neutral way. You either wait for God or you go on to satanic express train. So, he said, we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from Egypt. So Aaron said, okay, take your gold rings from your ears, your wives, your sons and daughters. Bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And Aaron took the gold, melted it down, molded it into a shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Israel. I tell you, the Lord was not pleased with that was an abomination and insult to God. The children of Israel will not wait for God. Why? Because they, will, they cannot sit still. You know, again, a previous message, we said we live in a, in a world of instant gratification. We, we see it, we want it now. And we bring that in our relationship with God. They want the immediate enjoyment. And that's what's happening in our world today. And it's getting worse. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, they will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and be lover of pleasure than, rather than, the, than God. People today love pleasure. They want enjoyment than to wait for God and God. And also, you see, God tests our faith. Like our bodies are tested during exercise, or you go to the gym, you know, to work out, you know, um, uh, work out and um, maybe you start lifting weights and you are testing your muscles uh, and after a consistent period of training you notice a change in your biceps uh, and um, you get stronger you're able to lift heavier things or maybe you're just in exercise jogging walking you find that uh, that um, you know you're able to exercise longer um, or, or, um, in wrong for longer periods or work for longer periods. So that's what happens. I remember when I started exercising, you know, jogging. Um, you know, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't jog for long. I run out of breath. But um, the, but the but the but as soon as I, you know, was more consistent, uh, I was disciplined. I had a plan. It wasn't hard. I didn't feel like going out jogging, but I just have to push myself. And gradually, I found out I'm, I'm, you know, running for longer periods. So I started from maybe half a kilometer to running 5K, uh, 5 kilometers, you know. And that's what exercise does. It makes you stronger. Yeah, and also, God does the same thing to us spiritually. He allows us to go through challenges, tests, you know, so that we are strengthened. So when you face challenges, instead of, you know, um, backing off or running away, you know, you stay focused. You, you know, say, God is with me, you, you know, go headlong and you're able to overcome. You look back and say, wow, this is great. And you pass that st test and then another one comes, you know, you remember the God that did it for you in the past, you know, and, and with that knowledge, understanding, you go to the next battle, you win. Because why? You see, God has no, God is not pleased when we turn back in battle, when we, when we, when we shy away from trials and you know, turn our backs on God, turn our back on prayer, turn our back on Bible study, turn our back first, say, well, it doesn't work for me. It does work. Now, why? Because the Bible says in um, um, Hebrews, um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, if you've got your Bible, so I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, now the just shall live by faith. My soul, but, sorry, I read that again. They just shall live by faith, but if but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That is, in the times of trials and difficulties, you just turn back, you draw back. You know, you say, this is not for me, it doesn't work for me. God has no pleasure in that kind of life. And it's said about the people of Israel in Psalm 78, 9 to 12, uh, and God was disappointed about this tribe, Ephraim. He said, the warriors of Ephraim do 
armed. They were armed with bows, with weapons, but they turned their backs and fled on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his instructions. They forgot what he had done, the great wonders he had shown them, the miracles he did to their, for their ancestors on the plain of Zohar in the land of Egypt. You see, they turn back. You see, God is not pleased when we turn back in difficulties, when we shine, when we go and hide in self-pity. You know, God wants us to stand up and fight because he's with us. You know, you know, we walk with God. We are co-workers with God. God is the Air Force. We are the ground troops. So, you know, he's, he's already gone ahead of us to give us victory. And also, why do we have to wait upon God? Because waiting as well enables us to see ourselves. As God sees us, You're able to see your level. Okay, it tells us allow us to see our level of faith, whether it is zero faith, or um, weak faith, or strong faith, because there are different kind of faith. In the Bible. for example, in Luke eight, verse twenty-five, we read, He asked them, "Where is your faith?" And because they thought they were going to drown, and, and the disciples said, "Who is this man?" They asked each other. When he gives the command, even the wind and the, and the waves obey him. They're, you say, "Where's your faith?" They're, we were operating in zero faith. And then you go to Luke twelve twenty-eight. You read about another kind of faith, and he said, "If God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have little faith?" That's little faith, weak faith. Okay, and then you find another kind of faith in Matthew eight ten. And it's about the centurion, you know, the um, centurion, that soldier that exercised great faith in God. And I'm going to reverse that. And he said, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed, turning to those who were following him. He said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this, like this in all Israel. I've never seen great faith like this in all Israel. So, you see, God was testing Abraham and Sarah to see what was in their hearts. Also, God tested the Jews in the wilderness. You find that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 2 to 6. Remember how the Lord your God led you to the wilderness for these 40 years. It was a long time humbling you, testing you to prove your character, to find out whether or not you will obey his commands. So God is going to test us, test us. You know, he said, yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry. You know, sometimes God allows us to wait for something, uh, deprive us of those things, you know, that people might have out there. Why? To see our character, to test our character, to see whether we we'll trust in him, you know, because he wants to tell us or teach us that people do not live by bread alone, by, you know, physical pleasures, by, you know, but, but by every word that comes from his mouth. That's what Jesus said when he was tempted. Man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from his mouth. And think about it, just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you. That's Deuteronomy 8, verse 5. Okay, and again, James 1, the New Testament says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider an opportunity of great joy. You know, um, so it's opening for us to, to trust God to grow in our faith. So what's the, sec what's the second lesson here? If uh, there's Someone said, um, one of my spiritual mentors, his name is Adrian Rogers. He said, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Okay? A faith that cannot be tested, you know, can't be trusted, you see. Um, trials, hardships, difficulties, and all kinds of challenges test whether we love God, whether we you truly believe God, or, or, or you're just a fear with a friend, okay? So when you go in this stuff, you jump ship. Again, you, you join the satanic cruise ship because it's easy. So you need to ask yourself this question, whose ship are you on, you see? Um, are you, because you can only be on one ship at one time. You cannot be either on, 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 on the lost ship um, or on Satan's ship, that's S-H-I-P, okay? So you can either be on the Broadway or on the narrow, on the narrow way, okay? You can, yeah, you can either be building your house on the sand or building your house on the rock. There's no neutrality, okay? So, someone said this, I don't know what he it said, scripture, um, that God gives a vision first, and then the death of the vision, the death, that the dying of the vision. And then he brings a miraculous fulfillment of the promise. We see this exactly in Abraham and Sarah. He gave them a vision, that was they're going to have a child, and then 
The vision died. Why? Because they passed childbearing age. And then the miraculous fulfillment. That's the amazing God. And it's happened life for Abraham, even Joseph as well. You know, so that he slept to Egypt. Moses too, you know, thought was going to be a deliverer, found himself looking at that ship in the desert. Then a miraculous recovery. And David as well, who thought, well, he was going to die because he was being pursued by Saul. Okay, so let's look, at, let's, let's look at another reason where we have to wait upon God. God wants to prepare us for what he's about to do through us. He's, so it's a, it's a form of preparation. So when we're waiting, God is preparing us. Um, God is preparing us. You know, God wanted Abraham and Sarah to impact their children. He was, he was training them, preparing them. So that they will pass this same faith to their children and generations to come, you know, um, to pre preparing them for the coming of the Messiah because Jesus was coming. Because God showed Abraham that Jesus was going to come, okay? So God was preparing Abraham so also to be people of faith to impact the world of believers, okay? And they have imparted generations and are still impacting us today. Today we are talking about Abraham and Sarah. He said their life has impacted many people, bringing encouragement and hope. Uh, and, 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 and people are able to trust God through their testimony. So, uh, going, using another example, Joseph. God was preparing Joseph as well. Um, uh, not only to be a leader in his household, but a leader that will bring peace, prosperity, and showcase the glory of God to the world. You can see that Joseph became one of the great leaders of the world in saving um, nations from poverty, from starvation. Also, God was preparing Anna as well, the, the mother of Samuel. God was preparing to be a strong woman of faith uh, and, and prayer to, to raise a godly child, not uh, a worldly child that's in the spoiled, you know, God wanted to, how to raise a child that would teach the ways of God to God's people and deliver them from their enemies. Okay, and we and we saw that in First Samuel chapter two, you can read that um, um, uh, Anna wrote one of the um, famous songs that was even sung by Mary. Um, um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, my soul rejoices in the Lord, my soul make her boast in the Lord, you know, and you know, so many amazing um, scriptures that is a blessing to us all, all today. So, um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the third lesson here? God is preparing you and me. God is preparing us believers today. If you are waiting, He's preparing me and you to be, for example, to be serious in our prayers and, uh, and, and listening to Him through His, His Word, the Holy Bible. You see, we find out that for, for Anna, for example, Anna got serious in, in our prayers. In First Samuel chapter 1, 10 to 11, we read, Anna was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made his vow, O Lord of heaven and earth, if you would look upon my sorrow and answer a prayer and give me a son, then I'll give him back to you. He'll be yours for his entire lifetime as a sign that has been dedicated to the Lord. You see, our life belongs to God. But... To, you see, but in, the, in our world today, we want to live for this world, we want to impress the world. We have things, or we go for things because we want to show up to the world, not for the glory of God. Okay, so um, God is preparing to be desperate, to, to, to be, you know, to be serious in our prayers. Colossians 4 2 says, Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. We need to devote ourselves. Maybe, I don't know how your prayer life is. You know, maybe you've given up, you are weak, you are, you know, here and not there, half-hearted. You know, so God wants us to be serious in our prayers. God is preparing us to get rid of also um, every walk of the flesh. When we say the walk of the flesh, it means um, those things that are contrary to the will of God, sins that are contrary, behavior that is contrary to the will of God, that, that might end up being a stumbling block to us in the future. 
that is sinful habits you know and if not dealt with will rob us of our blessings you see god wants us to god wants you to be well prepared for that position be because if you're a man of pride a man who is quick tempered you may have problem with your um employees or your colleagues at work you know you might be sitting for a, uh, a leading position because you're not humble enough you know you end up being demoted or even losing the job he wants you to be well prepared as a spouse for your marriage you know in, in your attitude in the way you speak in your mannerisms in you know doing the things that um you know you are called to do as a husband or a wife he wants you to be successful in business that you do things in a right way, in a just way, not, not using false balances and false weights. I want you to, be, to, to have integrity and honesty. I want you to, um, so he doesn't want you to call corner. He wants you to be successful in ministry as well. A lot of people want to rush into things. They feel they can do it. Oh, I want to be uh, rush into ministry. But they're not prepared spiritually. They see battle with some certain sins, maybe um, sexual sin or um covetousness and then going to the ministry they've had this problem because they just want to be there up there they want to be seen they want to be worshipped they want to be seen as arrived and they fall into sin they fall into one fraudulent activity or power tussle or sexual immorality and let's take an example in the bible esau in hebrews 12 14 to 17 it said esau did not deal with his sin and in the end he robbed him of his blessings hebrews 12 14 to 17 we read Walk at living in peace with everyone. You should be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. And walk at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. So I say, you might be everywhere we go. You have to seek at walking at peace, marriage, family, work. You know, he said, look, look after each other so that none of you fulfills to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you corrupting many you see because if you are someone that's you know you, you keep marriage you keep road you are so bitter it will affect people around you you say make sure that no one is immoral godless like Esau who traded his birthright as as a as the firstborn son for a single meal you know and that's what God is trying to do to discipline us so you don't trade your blessing for works of the flesh you know that after one when he wanted his father's blessing he was rejected it was too late or repentance even though he begged with bitter tears so are you serious about your needs are you serious about your request first peter 4 7 says the end of the world is coming soon therefore be earnest and disciplined in your prayer we need to be earnest we need to be disciplined we need to have a pattern in reading the world a pattern of prayer you know so how desperate are you for your needs what is more important to you than prayer amen what's more important to you than prayer daily reading of the word of god fellowship of the believers you know is it your friends you know you spend time talking with on the phone for you know uh, for hours or your imaginary friends on social media is it your job you know that's taking your time with god your or your time playing video games on your gadgets watching tv you know you know um Remember, God only acknowledges those who mean business. God will honor those who honor Him. Hebrews eleven six, the New King James Version. God, you know, um, without faith it's possible to please God. He, want, he that comes to God must believe that God exists, and it was those who sincerely seek Him, those who seriously seek Him, those who diligently seek Him. Okay, God is not going to reward half-hearted people. You know, I remember I had to wait patiently as well, uh, almost a year looking for a job in my own life, you know, with, from the excitement of opening the letter to receive, okay, you've been employed to fear of opening the letter when you've been receiving so many rejections. But I tell you, waiting upon God is no waste of time. Maybe you're waiting upon God, you feel your life is wasted time. It's, no, no, no. It's an opportunity to prepare, to build up yourself, to do what you need to do before that job comes and it was, it was a time for me that I went to adult uh, education to learn instruments and and I became um, 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 something that was useful for me that um, that God used in the ministry that was that he, uh, he called me into you know I wasn't prepared for but but I was able to use that in ministry I was able to teach 
I've got three girls, they all um, play instruments, and, and, and also people were also blessed to it as well, uh, or, or motivated to learn instruments. So um, your waiting on God is never wasted. So let's look at quickly the, uh, look at quickly the consequence of impatience. Okay. Uh, um, the cons- consequence of impatience. What Abraham did by listening to his wife or, 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 and going to a guy, the servant girl, wasn't okay. Um, Sarah's heart cry was for a child. So we should not, because of our spouse's behavior, think it's okay to commit adultery. It's not okay because there's the consequences to sin. And impatience will always get you out of the will of God for your life. Okay? Because impatience, when we're not impatient, it will get us out of the will of God, which is perfect for our life. Okay? Um, now, looking at Abraham and Sarah's example, it showed conflict in their marriage. Sarah blamed Abraham for Agar's behavior. Genesis 6, 14, Genesis chapter 16, 45. So Abraham had sexual relations with Agai, became pregnant. But when Agai knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarah with contempt. Then Sarah said to Abraham, this is all your fault. I put my son into your hands. Now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show you show who is wrong, you or me. So it's so conflict. And also Satan was able to sow an everlasting enmity between the descendants of Ishmael the father of Arabs and God's chosen race, the Jews, which is still on today. So what's the lesson? What's the fourth lesson here? Therefore, if you push ahead and do what God says, don't. You, or you have sex before marriage, marry, marry the wrong person, or take up a job, God says no, be in fraudulent business, or partnership, or, or, and so on and so forth. The Bible says in Numbers 32, 23, that if you fail to keep your word, then you, you have sinned against the Lord if you fail to keep the word of God. And you may be sure your sin will find you out. Do not be deceived. You will have lasting problems. You will reap what you sow even more than you sow. Though sometimes not immediately. That's what Galatians 6, 7 to 8 tells us. That don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You always harvest what you plan. Those who live only to satisfy their sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature but those who live to please the spirit will have everlasting life from this so if we live to please the flesh do things our own way we will reap decay we will, we will reap death but if we re- if, if we follow the spirit we, li- we, we, we reap a life of peace so god wants to teach you patience psalm 62 says you know i wait quietly before god for my victory comes from me. So wait quietly before God. Psalm 135 says, I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I'm counting on him. I've put my hope in his word. But you know, the good thing is this. Despite the wrong choices of Abraham, God loved them. He forgave them. But he cannot erase the circumstances caused by their wrong choice. They have to deal with Ishmael. Okay. And their descendants have to deal with the descendants of Ishmael. So, God is ready to forgive and manifest his glory through our situation. Our God is a God of grace and a God of forgiveness. We've all made wrong turns. We must accept. We've all made wrong turns in life. But God in his mercy forgives us and works out everything for good. For example, the family of Naomi took a wrong turn to, go, to leave Belém to go to Moab. But God used it for his glory. He brought that root a Moabite who became a believer, who married Boaz and gave back to a child called Obed, who was the um, grandfather of King David and also the ancestor of the Messiah. So though the brothers, brothers of Joseph did evil to him, sell him as a slave to Egypt, they were forgiven. The evil plot turned out for good. As, David, as Joseph said in Genesis 50, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of you and your children. So you reassure them by speaking clearly to them. But if you are not saved, as we running up this session, things will not things will, will work out bad for you. You see, for the for the believer, all things work together for good. Romans 8:28 says. 
And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. But if you do not love God, if you do, if you do not have a relationship with God, things will work for evil for you if you are not born again. So, if you are not born again, if you are not giving your life to Christ, if you are not sure if you are to die today, you go to heaven, now is the time for you to give your life to God. And God can make all things work together for you. All the past mistakes that you have done, the, the wrong turns you have made, God is able to turn it out for good. He says, even though your beginning is small, you had a bad beginning, God is able to make it good. Your latter end can still be great. And so if God is talking to you, why don't you give your life to Christ now? You say, how can I do that? Jesus said, whosoever will call upon me in repentance and faith will have eternal life. Now, I can lead you in a prayer according to scriptures to do that if you will follow me and pray to God sincerely by saying repeat by saying these words heavenly father i come to you in the name of jesus i confess that i am a sinner i believe that jesus christ died on the cross for me i believe that he rose again from the dead I receive him into my life. I confess him as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for making me your child today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer, you mean with all your heart, welcome into the family of God. Your name is written in God's book of life. You have eternal life. The Bible says he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Not temporary life. You have eternal life. And to um, prove your salvation, you need to start reading your Bible. You need, need to start praying. You need to find a church, a family where you grow in your faith. So God bless you for listening. If you're already a Christian, I hope that this is encourage you in your faith, not to give up, not to be discouraged, but to be strong. And you see God's goodness in the light, in the land of the living. So as I always say, please to share these messages on your platforms like tracts. Just post it so that people can be blessed. Who knows that through your sharing, someone else will come to know the Lord. We all walk out together in the vineyard of God. So if you're not subscribed, press the subscribe button on our YouTube channel, which is uh, uh, YouTube at Noah's Ark Sanctuary Church. You can always join us as friends at Facebook and as well. So thank you for listening and see you next week as we um, um, talk about the final conclusion on um, how to handle waiting. So thank you and God bless you for watching.